Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our fall 2021 University of Texas Press Advisory Board author event. I'm Robert Devins. I'm the director of UT Press, and it's a real pleasure to welcome you all. Today's event will be a conversation with Dr. Leonard N. Moore and Dr. Kefralyn D. Brown, exploring issues raised by Dr. Moore's terrific new book, Teaching Black History to White People, which UT Press proudly published last month. This is a book that combines deep research with personal experience in and out of the classroom, and I know it will spark a fascinating conversation. I'd like to thank both of our speakers for sharing that with us. Before we get started, a few additional words of thanks and announcements. Most important, I'd like to thank the members of the UT Press Advisory Board, which is sponsoring today's event. Mickey Klein, our board chair, Christine Aubrey, Christy Carpenter, Tobin Levy, Lawrence Miller, Michelle Moore, Janet Pearson, Jean Rather, Ellen Randall, and Daryl Windham. Thanks to each of you for your ongoing friendship and support. Next, if you do not yet have a copy of Dr. Moore's book, we are offering a 30% discount to our attendees tonight, and we'll add that discount code to the chat. And finally, if you value the mission-driven not-for-profit work that we're doing here at UT Press, publishing books like this one that really drive important conversations, then I hope you'll consider supporting us. You'll see a link to do that at the top right on our homepage, thank you. And now to introduce tonight's speakers, I would like to pass the microphone to my colleague, Carrie Webb. Carrie is a senior editor at the press and much to the envy of the rest of us, she is Dr. Moore's editor and got to work with him on the making of this book. Carrie, over to you. Thanks, Robert. And Hello, everyone. Um, I'm so pleased to uh, get to introduce both Dr. Moore and Dr. Brown. I'm so happy they could be here with us uh, to talk about this book. And I have to say, it's been a wonderful experience getting to work with Leonard in shaping this book. Um, I really feel that the enthusiasm and openness he brings to the classroom is really the same approach he brought to working with all of us here at the press, whether it was with me, in the early stages of reviewing this to all the way through editing and publicizing this book and talking to you all about it. Um, I feel like every time I hear Leonard talk about African American history and his experiences teaching this history here at UT, I come away learning something totally new. Um, I find myself rethinking what I did know and, and rethinking my perceptions of this history. And I can I think we can all agree this is one of the things, the main goals of, of a good education is to come away with new knowledge, come away with rethinking um, our own assumptions and presumptions, biases, what have you, um, as we learn. And we hope that this book will bring some of that same experience to readers, both on the UT campus as well as beyond. Um, and so I'd like to say a little bit about uh, Leonard Moore. Leonard N. Moore is the George Littlefield Professor of American History and the former Vice President of Diversity and Community Engagement at the University of Texas at Austin, where he has taught since 2007. Professor Moore is the author of four books on Black politics, The Defeat of Black Power, Civil Rights, and the National Black Political Convention of 1972. Black Rage in New Orleans, Police Brutality and African-American Activism from World War II to Hurricane Katrina, Carl B. Stokes and the Rise of Black Political Power in America, and of course the book we are discussing today, Teaching Black History to White People. At the University of Texas, Professor Moore teaches a class on the Black Power Movement and a signature course titled Race in the Age of Trump. Together these classes enroll over a thousand students each fall. Kefralyn D. Brown is professor and distinguished university teaching professor of cultural studies in education in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction at the University of Texas at Austin. She holds a faculty appointment in the Department of African and African Diaspora Studies, the John L. Warfield Center for African and African American Studies, and the Center for Women and Gender Studies. Her research and teaching focuses on the sociocultural knowledge of race in teaching and curriculum, critical multicultural teacher education, 
and the educational discourses and intellectual thought related to African Americans and their educational experiences in the US. Professor Brown has published over 40 books, journal articles, book chapters, and other educational texts. Her most recent book is After the At-Risk Label, Reorienting Risk in Educational Policy and Practice. And I'd like to add, um, before I hand it over to Leonard and Kefferlin, if you'd like to ask a question, please be sure to use the Q&A function. You should see that at the bottom of your screen. It'll say Q&A. That's where you can go to click onto that to add any questions you have for us towards the end. Um, and not don't pose questions in the chat. Please use the Q&A function. And now over to you, uh, Leonard and Kefferlin. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Carrie, the, the best editor in the world. Thank you also, Robert, and also Cameron. It's been fun working with you all over the last, well, over the last uh, eight, 18 months or so. I told somebody, this was Carrie Webb's big idea. I was minding my business during the summer of 2020, and she said, Leonard, why don't you see if you can put those ideas in a book? And so here we are. So Professor Brown, thank you for joining us on Sunday afternoon. Thank you for giving up uh, one of your Sundays. I know you got two little ones running around, but thanks for hanging out with us and hopefully we can have a robust conversation. Glad to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Looking forward to it. Thank you. So, so Catherine, I like to tell people, because people are always asking me, you know, how I got to UT and, I, and I'm gonna ask you the same thing. You know, I, I tell you, I'm a product of Cleveland, Ohio, uh, went to Jackson State University in Jackson, Mississippi and went to Ohio State and got a PhD. And I never thought I would be in the South. I thought, you know, my entire career would be in the Midwest and Northeast, but uh, went to LSU when I was there uh, from 98 to 07, and I came to Texas in 07. And carefully, I don't think many people realize what initially brought me here. And this, you're going to laugh when you hear this story. Um, at LSU, me and a colleague had done a lot of work uh, with the football team. When I got there, it was low, poor graduation rates, off the field problems, people going to jail, just so forth and so on. And so me and a colleague really put in some initiatives to basically to clean it up. And, and, I, and I tell people carefully in that, a result of that cleaning up was two national championships at LSU. Uh, and if you remember 06 and 07, for those of you who follow Longhorns football, that was a year where a lot of UT football players were going to jail. Uh, the, the slogan was not hook them horns, but book them horns. And so uh, Bill Powers, the president, Greg Vincent, the VP, and I think some alums saw the work, saw me featured in the New York Times article. And so that's what sort of got me here, which is kind of funny. And I've been here 14 years. What about you, Carefullyn? How long have you how long have you uh, been here and what brought you here? So I've been here since 2006. Mm -hmm. um, this is my 15th year. I am from Texas. I'm from Houston. I grew up in Houston. I left uh, in my mid 20s to go to the West Coast uh, to teach. I was a part of a teaching program, a very new program at the time. It's no longer a new program, Teach for America. And I went to California and taught, but knew that I wanted to become a professor, never imagined that I would come back to Texas, just understanding how academia works. Um, and I I'd also wanted to, to, to experience other parts of the country. So I lived in New England, I lived in the Midwest, and after graduating from my program, University of Wisconsin-Madison, I think I must have told my husband, who's also a professor here, there's only one university I would even consider going back to Texas for, it would be University of Texas at Austin. And I didn't know, you know, I didn't go here as an undergrad, but I just felt like it would be the kind of university that that would be a good place to go. And I didn't think it would ever happen. And it did. And so I've been here for 15 years, never thinking I would, I would, I would come back after I'd left and had been gone for, for quite some time. You know, when I left LSU, I thought I'd be going up north. I still hold a grudge against the University of Michigan because they didn't let me in their PhD program. So, uh, so I figured maybe they, they might circle back and make up for it by giving me a professorship. But you know, so I've been teaching carefully in black history in the deep South. And to, to me, Texas is deep South. You can say it's Southwest, but to me it's deep South. But I've been teaching African-American history in the deep South. This would be my 24th year in the classroom. And I think I've taught close to 20,000 students and half of those students have been white. When, when you read about that in the book, did it surprise you? Of all, of like all the white students who've taken my course? It didn't necessarily surprise me because I know what University of Texas at Austin looks like. And I know mm -hmm. what our, you know, our population 
looks like. Um, I will say, and I also know about your course, um, uh-huh. and I know how popular your course is. Um, I, it, it's not uncommon for me to actually have students that will end up in a course that I teach that might be much later, you know, it's a more advanced um, course that says they, they took your course and they loved it. And I usually know that those are going to be students who will really talk and, and share and will bring um, a good background knowledge, um, even if it was new knowledge that they got to, 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 the, to, um, to the, um, uh, the classroom. I, I, I think when, I, when you first started teaching it, I, I would have been surprised, but it, it caught on. And I have to say that, that students really do enjoy it and feel like they learn a lot in the class. I think one reason it's called Earn Care for Lynn is because, you know, here's the one thing me and my white conservative neighbors agree about. We agree, we agree on Jesus and nothing else, but maybe one did this other thing. I do believe, and this may be somewhat controversial, that, that the college classroom has become so far left-leaning. Let me say this, that I don't think we we I don't think we create space for other viewpoints. And I think that. Um, what I found is that people appreciate my class. I tell them, you can't get mad at anything anybody says. My class is not a safe space. We're not going to give them no trigger warnings. And if you don't like what somebody says, that's your fault. Now, again, you can't, we're not going to let you say anything hateful or incite violence. But, you know, we had a situation in class the other day, carefully, where, um, you know, we the subject of toxic masculinity came up. And, and I just said, well, if there's a toxic masculinity, should there be a toxic femininity? And the feminists went crazy carefully. But but my point is, you know, I think I've had success because people realized I'm not coming in with an agenda. I don't care who you vote for. And in many ways, my approach is, my goal is to prepare you to be competitive in a global marketplace. And, you know, I, I, I have one group of students, I call them my West Campus conservatives, great students, you know, all economics or finance majors, they want to go to Wall Street. And I tell them, you all got, you got, you all have to be culturally intelligent. And I really believe that starts with, you know, understanding African American history. Why do you think some people have had trouble um, teaching African American history or teaching courses dealing with race? Just period. <clears throat> well, I think you know. I, I, let me first say that I think your your approach to teaching is a really important one, and one that if a student gets an opportunity to have that experience, you should have that experience. Um, all classes are not organized quite like that. Um, and and the the fact that you have such a large class and that mm-hmm. students are still able to engage. I, I teach in, in smaller classes, so there's there's right. lots of discussion or space for discussion, but that often isn't the case when you go into a large um, history course. And so I think that it's really uh, valuable. Why do, I, I think that, it, it, you know, sometimes those kinds of courses might be challenging for students who come in and they have not had a lot of background information to make sense of what they're hearing, right? So, you know, I go back to my old, you know, I'm not a psychologist. We may have some psychologists on this call, so I don't, I want to be careful when I say this, but my undergraduate degree was in psychology and I thought I was going to go to graduate school for psychology, but I remember this concept of schema, right? And so there's a schema that we often bring into the classroom that's built around what we've had exposure to, mm-hmm. a, a prior knowledge that we bring to the that we bring with us when we when we when we're learning, and everything gets filtered through that. Yeah. And so sometimes, especially if you have a space where information that students are learning is not something that they've learned before, it's new, and in some cases it might even rub up against knowledge that they've had before. It can create dissonance right? Until you can create a, another schema, right? And so you giving that space for students to process, I think helps them to potentially widen the schema and not shut down and say, this makes no sense to me at all, um, or, or, to, or, to, or to resist it and to just say, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to accept it. And so I think it's very smart pedagogically. It, it's, it's not only smart, it's, it's astute pedagogy to create that kind of space when you know that that's probably going to happen. And you, and you know, Kevin, thank you for that. One of my favorite students is this guy named Jesse. I need to describe Jesse for y'all. He's about 6'6", six, six, white guy, humongous, straight country, um, not from Texarkana, but around Texarkana. And so he took my Black Power class, uh, Kevin, 
And every day after class, Jesse will be waiting. You know what I mean? This is, he's straight country. And, and we just developed a very, very close relationship. And it was funny. So I guess it was raccoon hunting season that was coming up or something like that. And he said, well, Dr. Moore, my uncles want to know if you want to come up and go hunting with us. And I said, with guns? He said, yeah. I said, no, Jesse, I'm going to sit that one out. But the students who seem to me who grow the most are the students, I would say, who you would least expect it. You know, a lot of rural kids. I remember Keflin in class, you know, asking, uh, asking uh, students, how many of you all went to a high school where there were no AP courses offered? And I thought it was going to be, honestly, I was stereotyping folk. I thought it was going to be a bunch of black kids from the inner city and a bunch of Mexican kids from the valley. Three white girls raised their hand from rural East Texas, and they said, no, Doc, you know, you know, the only AP class was an hour and a half away at a junior college with the, that they went to once a week. And so I've just been able to come into contact with so many different students that sort of defies all the, all the stereotypes, but it has been sort of a... It has been sort of a labor of love. You use that big word pedagogy. You can you explain to, to folk what that is? <laughs> so pedagogy is just the probably the original word or, or one of the original words to talk about how we teach. Uh, it's the it's the methods that we use to teach and and the way that you organize your 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 course. You have very there's a very specific sort of set of pedagogical methods or teaching methods that that you use um, to help your students learn. Well, well thank you for that. I, you know, I don't use, I, I'm not familiar with all those big words. You know, it's funny. I tell, I tell, I told my wife that every, what well, once a year or so I'll have a white student come up to me and who'll be like, well, Dr. Moore, you know, my mom didn't want you to take my, didn't want me to take your class. And I'll be like, why not? And I talk about this in the book. And one student says, well, Dr. Moore, she says she doesn't want, she doesn't want you to turn me into a liberal. And I said, well, who, who, who says I'm a liberal? I tell people, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a product of a black church ordained in a black denomination. I hang out in some white evangelical circles, you know what I mean? But, but they want to put me in the liberal box. And so I said, so what made your mom decide to let you enroll in it? Talking about helicopter parenting. She said, well, my mom said that I could take the class on one condition. I said, what was that? That, you know, I had to send her the syllabus. My mom bought all the books. And every day when lecture is over at 1230, I had to take a photograph of the notes and send it to my mom, and we would, <laughs> and we would discuss the class every Tuesday and Thursday night. But but here's how here's how I think the power the transformative power of education. Carefully, the mom sends me an email at the end of the semester, basically telling me I didn't want my daughter in your class. I thought you were going to poison her. And she talked about how she read the books and participated in the lectures. She said, Dr. Moore, you have changed my family's entire outlook on race in America and particularly uh, the, the black experience. So, so Catherine, in your graduate courses, have you found, you, do you have similar transformative experiences with you know, your grad students? Graduate students, in some cases, we do have graduate students that might come to a program and not have a real uh, history. In fact, many graduate students come to, to graduate school and don't really know about the history of schooling. Um, I'm not a historian of education, but I recognize that in order to talk about sociocultural issues that, that have impacted schooling, you have to talk about the history of school. Um, and I, that is probably one of the uh, most enlightening um, spaces for those students. They say that those are histories that I just didn't, I wasn't aware of, I didn't know about them. Um, I think the same for even undergraduate students. They don't, they definitely don't know those histories. Uh, and, and to some extent, they've never really had to think about the way that social cultural factors like gender or SES or uh, language or um, sexuality or race, uh, religion, culture, how they impact schooling and how they've always been a part of actually the, 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 the very sort of organizing of public schooling uh, in, in, in our country. And so, yes, I think there is a sort of um, enlightenment that comes from that, um, having that exposure uh, that I think they, they take with them and that helps to uh, deepen their own uh, practice, future practices and research. One of the questions we have, uh, uh, Dr. Brown, is Sonia asked, yes. how can a non-UT person get in the room? I, I got to tell this story, I talk about in the book. So, uh, that I'll call, they did an article about my class back about four or five years ago. And in the article, I invited UT alums, 
just to come sit on the class and hang out. So there was a 77 year old white guy, uh, Kerflin, um, UT alum. He came every day for 15 weeks and he was just soaking it up. And at the end of the semester, 500 students stood up and gave him a standing ovation because they always wondered who was this white guy in the class? And they were like, oh, they sent somebody to spy on Dr. Moore, you know, but, um, but he just said, he said, Dr. Moore, I thought I was educated. He said, but I've never been exposed to any aspect of black history whatsoever. And he said he felt like he had been sort of cheated, you know, sort of cheated out of an education. So, so Kevin, let me ask you a question. What would you say to parents? Because I'm hard on my Westlake and Lake Travis and Highland Park parents because I teach all their kids, right? So what would you say to them about why their kids should get it, why they and their kids should be exposed to African-American history? I think it's important for you to be in, look, I have my little one, she's always going to make it, I heard the door, so if y'all saw my eyes going that way, it was about to open it. <laughs> um, I, I think it's vitally important um, for a couple of reasons. The first is that if you want to be an educated person, you want to have a fuller, more robust and comprehensive understanding of knowledge. And what we do know, um, and what we fought for many, many years, I mean, centuries, that, that, that the curriculum is often not as inclusive as we would like it to be. And, and certain histories, you know, they're histories, but they don't make it into, or they're not, they're not they, they don't figure prominently, or they're not centered in um, traditional history, which is one of the reasons why we have the notion of a black history or an Asian American history or indigenous history, whatever we might be talking about. So I think if you just want to be a more uh, educated and knowledgeable person, you need to have that information. But it's also important um, to have that information for many of the reasons that you said earlier, that if you're going out into the world, and I think about UT and that very, you know, our sort of audacious statement that what starts here changes the world. Um, if we're going to change the world, the world is a very diverse, globally diverse um, place in lots of different ways. And if we don't have, if you don't have those histories, you don't have that, those understandings, you don't really understand the way that our worlds have operated. Um, and it may be even harder for you to communicate across um, different groups, across difference, because we also know that um, in general, our sort of social spaces can tend to be homogenous unless we work actively to create more diverse spaces. And I mean diversity in lots of different ways, not only around race, um, but you know, in, in, all, in, in a lot of different ways. So unless we actively work towards that, um, you, could, you could literally move through the world without those understandings, which is why you have people that come into the classroom and they say, goodness, I've been on this planet 55 years and I, I, I've never learned any of these histories. Right. You know, uh, there's a question in the question that Jeremy Suri, my colleague, asked, how do, you know, how do I get, you know, students to understand structural racism? And I'll, and I'll, I'll pass it off to you carefully after this. Um, I tell people, I don't have to get them to understand. You know, one thing about being a historian, we can just deal with facts. And, I, and I'll say something. I say, if Black people in the state of Texas were effectively disenfranchised for 70 years, couldn't vote for 70 years, think about that now. I said, how will we ever catch up? You know, and what is the remedy to that? We don't like the term reparations, but I tell people all the time, I'm not talking about slavery, but if we have people like your grandparents, careful in Texas, my grandmother in Louisiana, people were paying taxes into a system for decades that they could never access. And so I don't have to say, is this structurally racist? When we talk about the prison industrial complex, I take them to the stock market and I tell them to type in, Corrections Corporation of America. It's a publicly traded company that manages private prisons. When we talk about housing discrimination, I don't have to talk about it. I can put up images of restrictive covenants and things of that nature. And so for me, I never really have to spell it out. For, to me, it is sort of just, you know, showing, laying out the evidence to students. And I think this is why I've had success. I lay out the evidence and tell the students, you do with it what you will. Let's look at UT, for example. You, the only group UT has ever excluded has been African-American people. No other group has been ever legally excluded from the university. And I tell the students, that was 1956 when they integrated, was it a coincidence that that's the first year UT required standardized testing? <laughs> and so for me, I don't have to, 
say is the U.S. is systemic racism, is systemic racism, popular structural. As a historian, I like that. I can just lay out the evidence. How about you, uh, Carefully? What approach do you take? <clears throat> So this is a, you know, you've already given some really great examples and that I don't need to offer. I, this okay. is one reason why history is so vitally important for, for many of the students that, that come into the classroom. Many of them think about racism um, or have historically thought about racism. We may be, we may be in, a, in a moment where things are changing, where younger people are, are understanding a notion of structural racism maybe a little a little better, but I would say for the for the for the vast majority of time that I've been at, at, at UT, many of my students come in and they think about racism as being something that one person does to another. It might be something that a person says um, to another person, or if someone is you know mean to them, and often they think about they thought about it in the context of history. Right. So they think about Jim Crow. They know that there were place, you know, we had ra ra legally racial, legal racial segregation. Um, one of the best ways to sort of explain structural racism, which for many people is can be sort of abstract in some in some ways, um, is to talk about um, these histories of how there were legal uh, ways that 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 groups were disenfranchised. Um, in a variety of different ways. Um, and so I, I, my students, because we're in, we, we learn about schools, we, we, we spend some time talking about the history of housing discrimination. And just the, you know, we look, we also look at wealth disparity. And, and you know, you ask yourself, how do we, why is it that we have such disparate difference uh, between groups, um, between racial groups around um, wealth? And we have many examples in our society that, that legalize racism around wealth, right? And so that's one of the important ways that we talk about it and schools play, and, and home ownership plays such an important role in schools, the quality of schools where people can go to school. And so um, that's probably one of the more important ones. And then they also learn, we also spend time talking about how there are certain kinds of societal messages that have historically been um, a part of the way that our society has operated. And, and we see evidence of those stereotypes going back to you know, the 1700s. And we can still see uh, ways that those emerge even in, in contemporary times um, and how those sometimes can play a role in the, in the decisions that people make um, and the way that they look at um, different communities. So trying to really help them to make sense between legal yes. structures, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. also uh, those that are societal, that are deeply endemic um, and sometimes get taken it, you know, we don't even, sometimes the students don't even take, you know, take them seriously or even think about them much because they just seem, they're normalized. They, they right. just seem like taken for granted ideas. <laughs> you know, that's in the book, and I want to talk about Jim Crow in for a minute. And then I, first of all, I think that's a period we need to, to study more of, and I'll be teaching a class on Jim Crow in the fall. But, you know, in the book, I give this Monopoly example. I'm a great Monopoly player. You know, I grew up playing in Cleveland. Um, trans hey, don't tell anybody this secret, but if you buy all the railroads, you may not win the game, but you won't lose. You'll never go bankrupt. So that's my secret, you Monopoly players. Just get all the, do what you got to do to get all the railroads. But anyway, so I set up this analogy, Carefully, because I remember I had an older white guy to Dallas, older pastor. He just said, he told me, Dr. Moore, just, you know, I just don't see all this racism that people talk about. And I said, Pastor, from where you sit, you wouldn't see it. And so I remember taking him through this Monopoly example. Let's say all of us get together and play Monopoly. Carefully, me and you, the only Black people, we got 109 UT, uh, UT Press donors playing Monopoly, all right? And so from the looks of it, we are full participants in the game, right? You know, we sit down, we get our money, but we are told, now Carefully and Leonard, the rules are going to be different to you. You can go around the board, you can pay taxes, you can pay rent, and of course you can go to jail, but, but, here's, but here's the one rule for you. You can't buy any property until you roll for the 20th time. And so on the face of it, it appears I'm a full participant, right? But if I can't buy any property until I roll for the 20th time, when it's time now for me to buy property, all the property has been bought. And so let's say we're playing that game and we get up and go to dinner and our kids take our place. So I get, I don't have any money. So my daughter takes my place. Carefully, your son takes your place. Our white uh, players, their kids take their place. They've inherited wealth. They look at our kids like, where's your money at? 
And they like, well, no, you didn't allow my parents to compete. And they say, no, that happened a long time ago. You can't blame me. And so I, I give that example to show people that the present is a product of the past. And, and we're talking about housing discrimination. My wife is from Pasadena, California. And if y'all went to the Rose Bowl in 04 and 05, you probably went right past my in-law's house. My father-in-law, is he's, he's deceased now. But when he moved to Pasadena in 1955, he wanted to buy a house on the wealthier, on the wealthier side of the Rose Bowl. They told him basically, well, if you're going to buy a house in, this, in, in Pasadena, you got two choices. You can live over there where Jackie Robinson grew up, or you want to live by the Rose Bowl. You got one or two streets where there are bungalows. Now, here's the problem. Was he able to move to Pasadena? Absolutely. But the house he wanted to buy is worth about $3.3 million now. And the house he had to buy is worth about $700,000 now. So how do we get particularly white America to understand the legacy of Jim Crow where we are talking about state-sanctioned discrimination? You just broke it down, <laughs> which is one of the reasons why we need to have history courses that talk about these topics. Uh -huh. And that talk about these particular practices that had a lasting effect, that uh, lasting impact, um, that continue to have an impact um, in the present. Um, I, you know, I think one of the powers of being a, the, the power of history mm -hmm. is that you can lay out like you said earlier, you lay out the evidence. You can mm -hmm. see that we have the historical record. You can look at that and you can see and begin to ask questions. Mm -hmm. if, if this is what happened, you're talking about this monopoly game. Right, right, right. You, can't, you know, you, you, what you see, mm -hmm. what we see is not the full picture. Right. So how do we help students to develop um, the capacity to ask questions that can go beyond just what they see, because I think that what you see, and I and I don't want to I don't want to say that what you see doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Experiential knowledge is really really powerful, but it can prove to be so powerful sometimes that people choose. You know, they sort of take on certain stories um, based on what they see and what other people have seen and passed down without understanding that there's there's a whole uh, you know set of factors that are going on behind the scenes and that have informed, that inform that moment. That is one of the things that I, th I think that we should be doing as educators, helping our students to make sense of um, conditions that they see that they may not have a full sort of robust uh, body of, of knowledge to make sense of. No, carefully, you, you know, you're right. Uh, one question the chat came through and, and I'm, I can't wait to see how you're going to respond to this. They said, how do we deal with microaggressions in class. And so I'll say this, I don't really deal with it in the classroom. I deal with it from my colleagues. Now, I've been a, now, now Ohio State told me back in June, 1998, Carefulin, that they were awarding me a PhD. I got a diploma, all right? Been a professor 24 years, endowed professorship, all that. I was at a faculty senate meeting, and I talk about this in the book. Shaka Smart was the basketball coach then. He was talking about you know, what he does as young man, preparing them for life after basketball. When the faculty senate meeting was over, one of my, I overhear one of my colleagues say, ask him, he's an assistant basketball coach. And he was pointing to me. And it's like, wow. And I remember, you know, you know, you know, just, just small stuff, you know, going to speak somewhere and I'm the keynote speaker and somebody saying, yes, and Leonard played basketball in college. I said, damn, I didn't know I played basketball in college. So for me, a lot of the microaggressions I get, you know, my neighbor, when he moved here, he found that I worked at UT. He assumed I was a football coach. You know, I got an eight-year-old neighbor next door. You know, we had some new neighbors move in. And he said, yeah, Mr. Moore, you know, what do you coach at Texas? And I'm like, why do y'all want to keep putting me in the athlete box, but my, but now, but but here's why. But here is why. If, if we are honest with ourselves, many of my white colleagues who went to predominantly white institutions, the only black students they came into contact with were athletes. So there's this idea that we must have went to college on some kind of athletic scholarship. So how do you deal with microaggressions, uh, Dr. Brown? So I have to say that in general, um, I've I've 
it's been over the last couple of years, I haven't had a whole lot of, of microaggressions, but I've had some, I've had my share of people doing things. I've had people put their hands in my hair. Wow. Um, I, I mean, I've had lots of different kinds of things personally, and I've had sometimes students say comments um, that might be um, offensive or hurtful to uh, students. I spend a lot of time in the beginning of the class laying out what we call rules of engagement. How how are we going to engage in this room so that everyone uh, can, 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 can participate fully and so that everyone can also learn? And we know that in some cases, people are coming in from very different places. And I, I spend time laying this out. And I talk about the fact that some students are coming in the class and they have already, they, they, they understand some of these histories. They've learned about them. Um, they have what we might call theoretical knowledge, right? They, they, they theoretically know about it, but they haven't, uh, they haven't experienced it. We have some students who come in who have actually lived it. And there's some things that I actually talk about in class that I've experienced, or better yet, that my children are experiencing, right? Um, and so they have experiential knowledge. So I talk about the different kinds of knowledge that we bring to the classroom. And, and I talk about the fact that it's really important that we don't censor ourselves uh, because we're not gonna grow from that. But we also need to sort of deepen our understanding. And when those points come up where we have questions to, to really inquire what's going on here? Why am I thinking about this in this way? What do I need, what do I need to know more about in order to answer this question? I found that in general, when microaggressions might occur, that they, they I don't think that they are overt. I mean, I've had maybe once or twice someone where I think they were purposefully trying to do mm -hmm. something. Right. And in those cases, as the as the instructor, if I think someone is trying to derail our class or making it difficult <laughs> for us to learn, then I have to say, OK, we can talk about this offline or I'm happy to talk with you or share, you know, if you have more questions. But in general, that doesn't that hasn't really happened. I think that students sometimes might say things that might be offensive to others to, to other students and they say it unknowingly. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, most of most of us try to offer grace in all situations, because we recognize we're not all coming from the same place. But it is something that we need to address and it's not something that we should ignore um, because it can, I think that that can create spaces where people shut down, they don't wanna learn or where some people just feel totally uncomfortable actually engaging. And I think that that's why you do such a great job of creating a space where, where, where neither of those things appear to, to be happening. Uh, real quick on that point, the students got mad at me. Let me tell you what I loved about President Trump. Hear me out before y'all just take that and post that. You know, I tell people when I teach my race and age of Trump class, I never have to worry about writing a lecture. I wake up in the morning and look at his Twitter feed. And, and, I, and I got in many ways the, 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 the content for today. The but there's a question uh, in, in, in the, in the Q&A. And the person asked, how do I deal with, how do I get people to understand white privilege? This may surprise y'all. Um, I think privilege is all relative. You know, I think to a certain extent, me as a black man being attached to this large white university, it gives me, you know, it gives me some, some degree of privilege. And, and, and I think particularly in the South, in the Midwest and the Northeast, we see poor white folks all the time. You know, we see poor white ethnics who are struggling all the time. I think in the South, like Houston or Dallas, I ask my students, where do poor white folks live at in Houston or Dallas? And they really can't tell me. And so, and, and so here's my thing with the, with, the, with the phrase white privilege, speaking of derailing a conversation. I think when white people hear the term white privilege, what they are hearing is that you're telling them they didn't work hard. I really believe deep down that is what they're hearing. I know most white folk believe income inequality is an issue. They believe that. Now they don't want you taking their money to, to, to even it out. But so how do you deal with, do you, do you discuss white privilege at all or, or how do you approach it in your classroom, Kathleen? I mean, I think the idea comes up I mean, when you learn about these histories, then you, you know, it's inevitable. It's, it, it's, it's, it's right there in your face. It's clear um, or these or certain practices that there were privileges that were there. I think that uh, one of the things that we talk about um, or that I think is really important to talk about is to recognize that one can work hard, one does work, you know, you, you can work hard and that doesn't necessarily minimize that there may be 
actual, I mean, you know, in some cases you could work really hard and there may be economic privilege that um, a family has and they're able to help you get into, uh, you know, a, 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 a test review program, mm -hmm. which is gonna be very different from a student whose parents may not have the economic capital to allow them or to, to help them get the kind of support that might be helpful and in, 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 in helping them to do better on a test, right? That doesn't mean that both of those students didn't study and work. Um, mm -hmm to get where they are. And so how do we um, hold the notion of an and in both? And I think that that, for me, I'm really, I, I try to make things simple so that we can be more complex. And I know that it's hard to have and in both. Mm -hmm. We've got to think about and in both. Um, and that's one of the things that I talk about. And I also talk about symbolic forms, right? The, you know, there's some forms of privilege that it doesn't, you don't have to do, you don't have to do anything just by virtue of who you are and walking in the space. There's certain privilege that may be given to you, but that doesn't mean that you still don't have to work um, and that you don't have to, you know, you know, do what need what may need to, what needs to be done in order to, 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 to advance. So that's I, I think of it as an and in both um, and really try to make it a more uh, complex idea and not just something that's flat, which unfortunately I think when it gets talked about as talking points, that it that it's seen as something that's just a flat, this is every, you know, you have I, I agree with you. Um, we have a considerable amount of privilege, much more privilege than any 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 family member of mine has ever had, you know, being an academic and being in a university, being at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, much more than others. Professor Brown, you know what's funny about you know how you know we're black and attached to these institutions. My son is in the tenth grade. He's a he's a pretty good football player. You know he he had a recruiting visit to Texas A and M uh, a few weeks ago, and I know I got a whole bunch of Longhorns on the on the call. Hey, but we got to liven up our football environment because that environment at A and M was unreal for three and a half hours. But anyway. So he got these lanyards with his name on them, you know, AM football with his name on it in his high school. And here's what I told him. I said, hey, man, he gets his driver's license in a couple of weeks. I said, hey, I want you to hang that little lanyard, listen to this now, on your rear view mirror. And people are like, well, I said, because if the police stop you, this is crazy, careful, but it's how I'm thinking. If the police stop him, then that lanyard will, will I mean, it, well, then that lanyard in many ways will, will, what am I trying to say? <laughs> you know what I'm trying to, it will serve as a source of protection for him. You know what I'm saying? Because now a and and it's just crazy the things that sort of, we have to sort of think about on a daily basis that many of our peers and colleagues uh, don't think about. Uh, let, let me shift gears a bit, because I, I have a chapter in the book specifically geared for white liberals, just, just for my white liberal friends. Uh, and one of my friends said, Dr. Moore, you're hard on white liberals. No, I'm not hard on white liberals. I just believe that often too many times they like to speak on behalf of black people instead of asking us what we want. And I want to tell a quick story. There was a um, situation um, at a law school and I won't mention the name of the law school, all right? So this dean of the law school called me from another city. He said, Leonard, man, you know, I got your name from somebody, we're having an issue. And I said, well, what's the issue? Follow me, there was a black professor, I think in law school, they get, they get one exam at the end of the semester. And the black constitutional law professor, the one question he had on the exam was, defend school segregation from a legal perspective. So basically, you know, 1954, Brown versus Board of Education, you know, you are the defense attorney, how would you defend it? And so the students were up in arms, up completely up in arms. They said the, the question was triggering, the traumatizing, and then they said they wanted the professor disciplined. Now, this dude is a tenured law professor, but they wanted him fired. And if not fired, they wanted some kind of supervision where he couldn't type out and he couldn't make out his own exams. I said, that's absurd. So when I went to the institution, I had a feeling, because I met with the students, the law school dean and the professor at the same time. I said, watch, when I walk in this room, it's going to be a bunch of white kids. And it was 13 law students, the white law school dean, the black law professor. Only two of the students were students of color, one black person, one Mexican person. And the leader, the ringleader of the group was a 31 year old white man. And he was just getting his white liberal credentials on. And so they were up in arms. So I asked the dean and the professor to leave the room. I said, let me ask you a question. I said, you all seem to be pretty upset about this question. They said, we are. I said, I said how many students did this law school admit last year? And they said about 330. I said, how many of them were black? 
I said the number is 14. I said, so you all are more concerned about a question on an exam than you are about getting more black students in the law school. And I just found that to be terribly hypocritical. How, how, how do you address sort of the performative justice nature of some white folks who mean well, but assume they know what we want? <laughs> You know, this is you're you're kind of getting at the idea, I think, of how do you I, I, I'm gonna call out what I think might be going on in that space and what students are are getting at. You know, how do you create spaces where um students feel comfortable, they feel like they are they're supposed to be there and that people want them to be there and that this is their space. Um I, I do think that there can be an aspect of performativity that can come up. Um, but that has to do with, you know, how do, you know, we, we, we make judgments about people, um, mm -hmm. you know, that's how our brains sort of work. And unfortunately, how, how we, how we decide in some cases, who is a person that seems like they will be supportive of me, or that they will protect me and, and who seems like someone that might not be mm -hmm. someone who will protect me. And I, I think that that's a, I, I imagine, again, I'm not a psychologist, yeah. but I imagine that there's something, um, that, per, that that provides personal safety mm. in, that, in that. So I, I so I don't want to dismiss what might be seen as as, as totally performative. But what I want to what I would what I would um, like to to jump on with that example is sometimes um, the performative can stand in the way of how do you make substantive change? And the substantive change is how do we have a, a more uh, representative uh, a, a group of people that are in this space uh, with the understanding that we might make that space more, you know, we can work to bring more people in, but we want to make sure that we're bringing them into an environment that is going to uh, be supportive of them. So I, I, you know, I think it's, I think these are all sort of complex issues that when one is talking about or trying to deal with issues of diversity and inclusivity, that you have an understanding that sometimes there can be performances um, and, and trying to understand where that's from. And sometimes it's about, I'm just trying to make sure that people know that I'm someone who's on their side and that I, that I recognize that there may be some challenges or some problems that we actually need to deal with institutionally. However, in order to do that, um, um, we wanna make sure that we're actually looking at the real fundamental things that can, that right. can make the space uh, a more you know, inclusive space. Right, right. Shifting gears a bit in the last chapter, in that, in that last chapter I talk about the white liberal piece, I also talk about the experience I've had with white executives, you know what I mean? And, you know, I, I tell them, I said, every, I said, and I, and I remember right before the pandemic, I was speaking to a group of bankers in New York City, about two months before the pandemic, about 40 bankers, uh, mostly the U.S., some from other parts of the world. And I was telling them, particularly those in the U.S., that the most important hire you can make is to hire an authentic Black person. And they see, they didn't know, Dr. Moore, what are you talking about? I said, with racial tensions as they were then, you know, and, and will be in the future, I said, you have to have somebody on your team who is confident and courageous and who can tell you not what you want to hear, but what you need to hear. And what I found, Carefulin, is that too many executives, they, were, they weren't hiring solid Black folk. They were hiring Black people who wouldn't say anything who they control. So when the organization faced a racial crisis, they couldn't go to that person for counsel. What they did, they went back until their, until their all white circle trying to get at, they didn't have the answers and you end up making the situation worse. And I tell, I, you know, I'm doing some work now with a bunch of ad um, advertising execs from across the country. And I'm telling them, you can't play with this stuff because you know, I mean, y'all heard what Trump said a couple of weeks ago, right? That all the Haitian people were bringing in AIDS. So this isn't going anywhere and corporations and organizations are gonna be need to be thoughtful in how they respond, but you gotta have authentic black people on your team who will tell you the truth and who will be honest with you. But I find is that oftentimes they wanna go, they wanna go the safe route. And I tell them, well, that may look safe, it's not safe because in many ways it could come and bite you in the end. So one question, we got five minutes. So that was more of a statement. So, so we got five minutes. So this is what all, this is what everybody's waiting for. This is what we got 112 people on here. And this is what my uh, white friends in the suburbs of Houston and Dallas uh, and my white evangelical friends, they want to know about this critical race theory. And is it 
in many ways, penetrating or poisoning the minds of our K through 12 students. You go. <laughs> well, I've had lots of conversations about this. It, it feels like people are reaching out and always asking me to either speak or to talk about this. Huh. I, can, I, can, I can rest assure, rest assure that critical race theory um, which I actually believe is a is a is a is a wonderful theory mm -hmm. that gives us some powerful information, a powerful sort of framework to think about race and racism as a historic phenomenon, um, and to see how it sort of manifests and the implications of it um, continue over time um, and in different places, um, but how how it looks over time. So I do not think it's a problematic um, theory. But that being said. Um, it is not taught in schools. Um, there are no, there are no uh, standards, state standards that, are, that, that you're going to find that say that students are expected to learn critical race theory. And in fact, I mean, you know, most students, you know, we learn a little bit about theory in college, but you may not go through your whole undergraduate experience and never learn about critical race theory. Um, uh, so no, it's not something that is, that is, K-12 schools, and it is not something that is, I, I also think that is going to destroy us. Unfortunately, um, you know, I think there's some, um, the, 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 the idea has gotten, um, I think, mischaracterized in a lot of, in a lot of ways. Um, um, but I can say that I don't think that it is in K-12 schools, not in any kind of pervasive way, and not even in a, in a, in a, in a superficial way where we're looking at what students are expected to learn in schools. So I don't know, Kevin, but you know, me, I, I, I speak to a whole bunch of tough, or I go to a lot of all white audiences and talk, white evangelical homeschool groups, uh, spoke to the Lakeway Men's Club out in Lake Travis. And when I said Lakeway Men's Club, an image went in your mind, that's it. You know, but some of the people on the call may be the Lakeway Men's Club. But anyway, so I get this idea that they don't want to talk about the bad parts of American history, right? Don't talk about lynching. Don't talk about disenfranchisement. And so what I do with my pastoral hat, if I'm talking to evangelicals, I go straight to the Bible. I say, if we believe that the Bible is the infallible word of God, it was God breathed, inspired and all that. Then, then I talk about Moses. I said, the worst thing Moses ever did is in scripture when he killed a man. The worst thing David ever did was got Bathsheba pregnant, had her husband killed and married her. And the worst thing the apostle Paul did you know, he was a killer of Christians. So I say, if if the Bible, those of us who believe in Jesus, if the Bible talks about the ugliness of people's lives trying to show a redemptive story, then by godly, we need to talk about the ugliness of American history. And here's what I tell my critics. We can't celebrate in many ways how far the U.S. has come without talking about the ugliness. And so, you know, I told somebody the other day, maybe we should bring the Confederate statues back out, you know, Put them back out, contextualize them. You know what I mean? But but if you're going to bring them back out or keep them up, you got to have a quote there from Alexander Stevens when he gave that cornerstone speech in 1861 where he said, the Confederacy is all about the inferiority and the subservience of the Negro to the white race. And so I believe we need to deal with all of it. I don't believe in whitewashing history at all. And I believe we, are, we should be mature enough as Americans to to grapple in many ways with the whole council of our history. All right. Any closing comments, for Dr. Brown, before we get off? No, I mean, I, I'll just say, having had the opportunity to read read your book, thank you very much for presenting it. Um, I, you know, I, I, I admire the work that you have been able to do on this campus, um, primarily through the, through, the, through the eyes and the lens of the young people um, on campus who really have been impacted and not in ways that I think are immediately apparent, but I think that for them, they have learned. And, you know, I was just talking to someone a couple of days ago, and perhaps I have um, a very idealistic uh, perspective on the work that I do, but I'm in, I'm in education. And so at the heart of, of what we do and what we're supposed to do, regardless of our field of expertise, is to teach and to educate. And it was because of brilliant scholars who made knowledge that I had never had access to available to me as a you know 20 year old who was in college but you know not really taking taking my work very very seriously kind of oh. kind of kind of kind of skating by it changed my life wow. 
I would not be a professor if it weren't for that for, for that that person and and for the wonderful teachers that I had subsequent to that experience. Um, I really believe that it that we have the ability to help people um, see the world potentially different, but to also make a difference in a positive way. And so I appreciate you doing that. I have to say that the that the that the um, that the 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 course that you offered that was the catalyst for this book. My uh, sixth grade at the time he was sixth grade. Now he's in seventh grade. Mm. Son um, listened in, and it was just <laughs> phenomenal. I thought, who gets an opportunity yeah. at eleven to hear professors talk? And he was just blown away. And some things were just he didn't, you know. You say you don't use big words, but you did. <laughs> you know, you're, you're talking about things, and he's wow, that's interesting. And now he's learning about American history really for the first time. And that course is going to help provide some information that he 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 might not have access to. Um, and so I want to appreciate I want to I want to say thank you. Um, the last thing I do have a question that I want to ask you and this is a, it's not off topic but I think that it's it's a, it's a, um, it's adjacent. Um, given the fact that um, you're you have you know courses that bring lots of people out, uh, many white students, so many students of color. I'm wondering how do you manage and negotiate or do you feel there are different um, purposes and ways of approaching that same teaching with your students of color. And it could, because, it, you know, sometimes I, I, it, it can feel like you're, you're, you're trying to do two different, because you're having to answer and address many different audiences. I'll say Mark, Marcus Garvey said it best. He said the teaching of history should inspire black people and it should show uh, white folks what they've done to black people. All right. So in many ways it has, and so I just operate with that. And it's not about getting white people to feel guilty. I mean, I have no desire to do that. You know, nothing is gained from that. But to me, it, you know, I hope my black students are inspired by it. Now, here's something I'm it's gonna trip you out now. When I talk to a lot of my students who are like, you know, Mexican American, a lot of my students, parts from Asia, whether it's India, uh, China, Japan, and even some of our students from Africa, a lot of them came to the States, or a lot of them grew up with this idea where they were told by relatives, don't be like black people. And these anti-black attitudes amongst all these other quote people of color, it is very problematic for me. You know, you know, my Mexican American students talk about that. Students from Pakistan and India and even Nigeria, Somalia, Kenya, Ethiopia. And it's just amazing to me how it seems like the first thing immigrants learn when they get here is don't be like us. And so here's what I remind all those students, and this is what I love about uh, history, is that I remind them, I say, your parents and grandparents probably would not have had the opportunity to come here if it weren't for the 1965 civil rights legislation. And I just gotta be honest with them. Legislation that opened up America's borders to people other than folks from Europe. And so we just have a, a vibrant discussion. Well, 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 thank you, Professor Brown. Somebody asked a question about, um, uh, voting rights in Texas, Black folk, we're not going to have none soon. But I don't think it is voter suppression. One author said, I believe that, you know, Republicans just want to take three or four percent, three knock the vote down three or four percent to win. But hey, uh, we'll see. Here, here's the thing about Texas that's interesting, and I'll close with this. The Texas I often read about in the news or hear about in the news doesn't always seem to be the Texas that I live in. And it's, 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 it's a contradiction. You know, I tell my folks in Cleveland, Detroit, and Chicago, black folk can make some money in Texas. You know, uh, and so, but, but you know, so it seems a place of prosperity, but also again, got these other things going on. Well, thank you all so much for giving us your Sunday afternoon. Um, you know, uh, I speak for myself. I've had a wonderful 15 years at UT teaching. Looking forward to another 15 if you all will have me. And I'm sure Professor Brown, uh, who gets job offers all the time, I'm she, she is only here because she wants to be here in Austin. But thank you all for hanging out with us this Sunday afternoon. We appreciate it. Thank you. Dr. Moore, Dr. Brown, thank you so much for sharing this conversation with us. This has been a little mini classroom. 
uh, for, for all of us. We so appreciate it. Um, and to all of our attendees, thank you for joining us. I want to acknowledge um, that some of you had a little bit of difficulty getting in at the beginning owing to some of the um, security protocols that UT has in place um, on Zoom. We will be emailing out a link to this talk if you miss the, the first couple of minutes of it, and that should be coming out later this evening. So look out for that. And thanks again. We've really enjoyed this conversation.